Good morning, Christ Church, and welcome to worship on this Sunday morning. We're glad that you guys are here. We're glad that we get this time to worship together. We get to start our weeks together uh, in the best possible way, where we come together in the presence of God to worship the God who sustains life, who ordains life, and who oversees everything that is going on. And so... A little bit different service if you're joining us online, if you're uh, new here for the first time here. So every third Sunday of the month, we um, do a shortened worship service. We worship for about 30 minutes, and then we, do, we break out into what we call missional communities. And so we've got three of them. Um, one is centered around fellowship, so doing things uh, within the fellowship of our church and our community and, and, and encouraging that. Another one is around food distribution. We have a number of ministries in which we... Uh, give food out to our community, to the people who need it the most. And so that, that community is working on addressing uh, that hunger within our county. And the last one is uh, what we're calling ministry partnerships. And so we do a lot of different ministries in partnership with uh, with organizations and churches around uh, the area, uh, and that is a, a group that works through doing that and planning that, executing that, and um, through that, this is how we do the work of the church. And so... Um, to start off our service, we're going to engage in that, uh, kind of a shortened time, so we're bringing in some elements together. One of the things we do every week during the school year is pack food for the kids in the local elementaries who need it over the weekends. And so I invite you during this first song uh, to join us in packing up some bags for those kids that will deliver later this week. Otherwise, uh, and if you're either uh, unable or would like to, you can feel free to stay in your seat and to pray for those kids, pray for those families, and to uh, begin our service and worship through the song that the worship team will lead us in. So, Christ Church, I invite you to join us in worship.
Even as we sing his praises and profess how much we've needed Jesus, it is good for us also to confess why we need him. So I invite you to join with me in this time in prayer of confession. Dear Lord, uh, we come before you um, as a church, as a people, as humans who have been ever so incredibly affected by and perpetrators of a sin that enslaves and overthrows and oppresses and corrupts each and everything that it touches. And so, Lord, we confess to you that we have sinned. We confess to you that we have not been perfect, that we have not loved our neighbors in the way that you love us. And Father, we ask for your forgiveness and your help. And as we would go forward, that you would change our hearts, our minds, our souls, give us the eyes, the ears, and the the mouth and the hands of you so that we could act in this world in a way that brings about salvation and deliverance and justice. Father, we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. The good news, as we have said so many times and and as a church body and but is good to be reminded of again is that God loved this world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but shall have eternal life Hmm. and I want you to, to keep those words in mind as we dig in going into this next section. So we have been starting, last week we started our series in the book of Exodus, uh, the gospel of the Old Testament. And this week we get to continue on in that book. Man, I wish we had a full hour to dig into this next section, but I'm gonna try to keep us within our time limits because we've got things to do and places to be and conversations to have. And so let's start in um, before we get right into this passage, which we're going to be in Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 through 25. So I invite you to join with me in turning there, but as you do, to consider um, this duty that we've been given. We know that God is a God who loves justice. Uh, He desires mercy and is gracious, but he's a God who desires justice. And that we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, are called to also pursue justice. So then, that begs the question, in a world that is so incredibly and so deeply affected by sin, how do we address injustice? Hold that question. Let us read Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 through 25. One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people, 
And he looked this way and he looked that and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and he hit him in the sand. And when he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man who was in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? And he answered, who made you prince or a judge over me, over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Oh, then Moses was afraid, and he thought, surely this thing is known. And when Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now, the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. And when they came home to their father, Ruel, he said, How is it that you've come home so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. And he said to his daughters, Well, then where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter, Zipporah. And she gave birth to a son, and his name was, and called his name Gershom. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. And their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Pray with me, dear Lord, as we dig into this scripture. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be working and helping us uh, apply, study, um, break open and dig in and to see and glorify you and to be edified throughout this time. Lord, as I preach, I ask that, um, yeah, I ask that my words would be those that you uh, desire for this morning. And Lord, where I need to be corrected, may I be done corrected swiftly. Pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So, how do we address injustice? Well, when we look into the story of Moses, Moses has grown up. He was, last week we talked about how um, the Israelites were facing genocide at the hands of Pharaoh, but Moses was born, a savior was born, and now the savior has grown up. And now it's time for him to start to learn and to step into what does this role as savior, as deliverer look like? And he goes out one day and he sees injustice happening. An Egyptian is beating a Hebrew. So he kills him. Interesting. But then the next day, his action isn't so well received. So Moses, he enacts justice. And and we we know from uh, Stephen's testimony all the way much later in Acts chapter 7 that he expected the Israelites to recognize what he was doing, that he was saving them, that he was working to deliver them from the oppression of the Egyptians. But what happens? They do not recognize that. Instead, they look at him and deride him. Which makes sense. Because the Hebrews don't know anything about this Moses character. They don't know his motives. They don't know his standards for applying justice. So what was probably most likely, the Bible doesn't tell us explicitly whether this was a good thing or a bad thing that he killed the Egyptian, but it was definitely a form of justice. Now the Israelites seeing this, hearing this, uh, have no idea (laughs) what justice to Moses means. And so when he comes out again and he again rebukes them, what is he going to do now? Are you going to kill us? Who made you prince and ruler of judgment? Now, it's a little bit ironic because God put him in that position, but they don't know that. They don't know who he is. They don't know what kind of brand of justice. They don't know how he uh, pursues any of this. Not to mention, Moses seemingly doesn't realize that his form of justice is only going to make things worse for the Israelites. As we've seen through societies that have enslaved people throughout history, what happens when the taskmaster, when the slave driver dies? It's the slaves who suffer. Whether they had anything to do with it or not, they make an example out of that, out of the punishment that will happen if someone so much as touches a hand on a taskmaster so that the slaves don't get any bad ideas. 
Moses, <laughs> Moses is getting the justice piece right. You see his heart, you see his desire, but there's something missing here. Now, this, uh, the city of Detroit um, went through an interesting, uh, similar type of, of exploration and, and that Moses was going to have to learn here. So uh, they went through, they, they recognized the, the benefits of trees in their city. And they went through this big, long initiative. They partnered with this organization called the Greening of Detroit to plant more trees in their city. And they've been, they had been ramping up their efforts over the period of about 25 years. And then in 2014, um, as they were trying to really achieve their goals, they were going into some of the lower economic neighborhoods, the poorer neighborhoods. And they were offering, hey, we will plant a tree for free in your front yard. And interestingly, they had a lot of people say no. So many people said no that, that uh, actually uh, researchers, people from around the country started to get interested in this one researcher from the University of Vermont, Christine E. Carmichael, wanted to know the reasons behind it. And so she went in and she started researching this and studying this along with, um, and also talking with the, with the organization. And the organization um, saw what they were doing as a form of addressing both social and economic injustice. Because one of the main, not main, but one of, one of the many markers of inequality between rich neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods, and especially, and this is around the country, but especially between rich white neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods of minorities, is the presence of large, old trees. Because trees provide an incredible amount of, of, of benefits. They provide uh, shade, they clean up air pollution, they reduce noise, they improve health outcomes, they in increase property values. And so the organization thinking, hey, you know, maybe, maybe these people just don't quite realize or, or need to be educated about the benefits of trees. And so they launched this kind of outreach to kind of benefit the, the, the neighborhoods they were trying to go into about, hey, this is why we're doing this, right? We're not just randomly doing this, but, but we have a reason and it's good for you. And it turned out the residents knew that. They knew the benefits. They knew that it was being offered, these trees were being offered for free. They knew um, that the outreach was happening and they didn't want them. Because, turns out, back in 1967, these neighborhoods used to have big, large, towering, shady trees. And then the race riots happened in Detroit and the city came and cut them all down. And so in the minds of these residents who remembered that, they did that because it was then easier to do surveillance on these neighborhoods and for law enforcement to crack down on what was ever happening. Now the city, right, the city says, well, they were elm trees and Dutch elm disease was going through the nation. We were cutting them down because they were going to die anyways. They were also flying helicopters overhead and spraying DDT on them. Eh, not a great choice, as we know now. Um, but that also kind of further, further uh, uh, exacerbated that dynamic of now the residents see helicopters flying over them right after this big clash with law enforcement happenings. And so clearly, right, this is a nefarious activity from the city. This is the narrative. Um, and who knows which one is right. It seems like there could have been a, a both and going on here. But as they said to this researcher, it's not that they didn't trust the trees. They didn't trust the city. NPR was doing a number of interviews, and one of the people they interviewed um, said, if you want buy-in, you can't just plant a tree and then leave. If you want people to care about it, there has to be a relationship. As Detroit started to learn uh, a lesson that Moses was learning here in this first section that effective ongoing justice requires relationship. It's not something that you can just hop in and do and then hop back out. No, there needs to be an understanding, a knowing, a familiarity between the people who are handing down justice and the people who are, you're hoping to serve justice for so that there can be trust. There can be um, yeah, trust, reliance, a, a safety within the actions that are being happened. So similarly, right, it's a lesson for us that as God desires for us to do justice, part of doing justice means that we can't just simply come in as the Savior, fix something and leave. No, there needs to be that ongoing relationship because often that, that model of coming in, doing something and leaving does a whole lot more harm in the long run than help. Here's the thing, when we read this story, and this is gonna be, um, this is maybe a, a tougher thing to, 
to keep in mind all the time is that we're not Moses. We're not called to be the savior of a country as an individual and the great leader, most of us, some of us maybe, but I'm not Moses. Most of us are not Moses. Where we are in the story, we're the people who are needing justice. As we've talked about before, but in the greater overall scheme of things, there is the ever overwhelming presence of sin in this world, oppressing and enslaving and corrupting all of life. And we are the ones needing to be delivered from that. Now, thankfully, thankfully, we know the one who does. We know Jesus. We know the Savior. And beautifully, we have this intimate understanding and relationship with him through the way that he's been shown, through the way that he's been revealed. But I often find that we separate the God of the Old Testament from the God of the New Testament. We, we break them up into two almost seemingly different deities. And I think part of the reason that we do that is that when we hear about the God of the Old Testament, he feels like this figure who's angry, who's vindictive, who comes in, who smites, and then he backs back out. And there doesn't seem to be a relationship with her. There doesn't seem to be a familiarity. There seems to be, um, as you read some of these stories, almost an arbitrary uh, application of justice. Some people die for things that seem incredibly minor. And other people, like David, are praised as one of the greatest kings in Israel's history when he did some horrific things. I think a big part of that, a big part of that maybe almost what I always call a misunderstanding is that lack of relationship with this God of the Old Testament. And my hope for us as we go through Exodus is that as I will get to see just how um, how far goes God goes to engage the people of Israel in a relationship. So, if effective ongoing justice requires relationship, how, how is that relationship built? How, is it, how do we build it to those that we are trying to serve justice with? How does God build it with us? Well, going on, if you go on in there into that next section, verse 16, you see that Moses goes and he delivers justice again. He drives off the shepherds who are, who are uh, uh, harassing and driving away these women just trying to water their flock but the results are different this time. This time he gets invited to supper. This time he gets welcomed into the family. This time he marries one of the daughters. What changed? Well, Moses, Moses didn't just simply drive off the shepherds. No, then he did the next step to serve them. He got water drew it up from the well, whatever water had been splashed over or taken from them or they hadn't had time to do, and he did it himself. He served these women. And in doing so, he showed his character. He showed his heart. He showed his empathy. He showed his motivations. That he's not there to be, um, <laughs> he's not there to be this, just this justice bringer uh, arbitrarily. No, thinking about it, if he had just simply driven the shepherds off and not done anything other than that, the women would have no um, assurance that he wouldn't do the same to them when he felt like it. There's no understanding of his motives other than, well, I felt like driving them off. But no, when he comes and he steps down and he pulls up his sleeves and he kneels down and does the dirty work of serving along with delivering justice, then, then it is most welcome. Then it is understood as an act of love. When I grew up, um, my dad was a law enforcement officer, fire marshal, so not a policeman, but he, his office was in the uh, <clears throat> regional headquarters for the state troopers. And so uh, during my time, during my life as I grew up, uh, the area state troopers served me soup and pie every year at a yearly supper. Uh, my neighborhood in the town, in our small town, was a police officer, and so I you know, knew him fairly well. And, and my, dad, my classmate's father was the fire chief. And I saw these guys, I saw these police officers, these state troopers, these, chi these, these fire officials coaching t-ball, cheering us on at football and basketball games, teaching us how to hunt safely at Pheasant Forever events, 
Service was just as big a part as how I knew these men as, I, as their duty to protect in the way and the role in which I related to them in that way. Now, when I went to go a couple counties over, I didn't know those police officers. I didn't trust them. Every time I saw a police car and I didn't know, this, I didn't know the license plate of the state trooper, I didn't, it wasn't a, a Milford police or an Okoboji police car, uh, there's a little bit of fear that came in because I don't know their motives. I don't know their intentions. I don't know them through the relationship of serving and then protecting. As we go through to hopefully deliver effective and ongoing justice, we have to do it in relationship for it to be effective. And that relationship, how do we build it? We build it through service, through serving. Because here's the thing, if people, if people who need saving could save themselves, they would. And so if we are going to seek to deliver someone from injustice, that means that we are going to need to serve them. And we have the beautiful example of, of Jesus, who not only did this in a way that we can emulate, but did this for us. As we read, going on from our, uh, our words of assurance today, in, in John chapter 3, verse 17, it says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And then how did he do that? How did he show that he was seeking to save the world? As we read there in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the style of justice that God has shown us that he both desires and that he is willing to do himself. Now, here's the thing. If we take the time to build up serving relationships with everybody who's suffering under injustice, we're not going to have time to help everyone. Not to mention that we're also people who need others to build up serving relationships with us to help deliver us as well. So we get to this last section of the text in verse 23. Now, all of a sudden, stepping out from behind the scenes... For the first time in the book of Exodus, God is revealed. And God's clearly been working up until this point. He's, though Israelite, Israel was facing genocide, they continued to grow and thrive. Though the midwives were ordered to kill the babies, they, their faithfulness is a testament to the work that God has done and to his, his testimony in the whole world. We've seen it through the protection of Moses, through the care of his mother and his sister, and through the provision of royal protection that he got to grow up in. But now, now we get to see him. He is revealed. He is shown specifically. And who is this God? Who is this God that the Israelites are being introduced to? Well, we see that he is a God who hears He's a God who remembers, meaning he has not forgotten them. He has not uh, looked away from them. No, he has had them in their minds. He has known them this entire time, and he sees them. He cares for them, and he makes himself known to them. My wife served overseas for a number of years, and one of the things that she, when she came back... Uh, that she pointed out about American Christianity is we have a, uh, we spend a lot of time telling about God and specifically saying words about how, how God is a good, good father, right? That's a popular song that we have. God is a good, good father. It's who you are. But the thing is that, that she uh, pointed out to me is that if she were to go and tell one of the girls that she worked with and was trying to bring out a sex trafficking in the Philippines that God is a good, good father, that wouldn't mean anything to them. Their father sold them to be trafficked. The men in their lives are either owning them and selling them or buying them and using them. There's no concept of a good father in their lives. 
Uh, that's something that we can apply to, to people who are in hard and traumatic places that are in need of deliverance, in need of saving. We can tell people who are blue in the face that God loves them, that he's a good father, that he cares for them, but how are they gonna know that? Well, we need to show them. Which is what God does here. God shows us who he is through how he is in relationship with us, ultimately through the intimacy of Jesus, becoming one of us, dying for us. And it's one thing I hope, and I I ask you, and I'm um, pointing out to your attention as we go forward, that God, God doesn't do a lot of telling in the Old Testament about himself. God does a whole lot of showing of who he is, of how he intervenes, of how he is in relationship with us. And implicit within this whole narrative, implicit about questioning these themes of injustice, implicit in the minds of of these women in the Philippines is why would God let this happen? Why didn't he step in sooner? Why didn't he step in in the Israelites' lives sooner? I mean, 40 plus years at least, 80 years before Moses comes to deliver them, Why didn't he do something sooner? Why did he even let suffering happen? But when we ask why, when a professor from seminary pointed this out as we were studying the book of Job, when we ask why, God shows us who. That feels really unsatisfactory. But my invitation to you, my, my hope through illustrating in this is that there's a reason it's necessary. Not simply to engage on the intellectual level of why this, why that, why this decision, why did this happen this way, but that God would show us who he is, how he cares, what he's willing to do to save and deliver a people that he doesn't have to but he does. And one of the ways in which we are reminded of that each and every week is when we come to this table. Each and every week we are reminded through this vivid showing that Jesus' body was broken for us. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it an illustration of how his body was broken for us. And after they had supped, he took the cup and he poured it out saying, this is my blood poured out for you. This is the God who loves you, willing to break his body and have his blood poured out for you so that you could be in relationship with him again for all of eternity. As we come to this table, a few things to note. One, we practice an open table here at Christ Church, meaning that if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to come and be a part of this supper with the saints and in this taste of the kingdom to come. Uh, another thing is that we serve gluten-free bread. So if you have a gluten sensitivity, please do not feel uh, any barrier in participating. We invite and hope to try to bring down any barriers so that all of us can come together. And then lastly, we serve both wine and grape juice. It is a, a rosé um, on the inner circle of the tray. So please take what is appropriate for you. The table is ready. Come and eat. Come and drink. Bye.
in this song doesn't mean an expectation that God's going to fail us, right? A lot of times we use yet to be like, you haven't done it, but you're going to. Yet is one of those words that has multiple meanings. And in this song, it, it is meant to be an emphasis of increase and of repetition. God doesn't fail, never fails, always stands. His promise stands. And so as we sing, as you sing that word in the song, don't sing it as a word of doubt. Sing it as a word of promise and as a word of praise and as a reminder that God never, ever, ever fails. church we worship a God who shows us not merely tells us of his faithfulness and as you go I invite you to go with uh, that reassurance but also uh, to depend on it to ask it to look for it and to see it for now um, we're not done yet we're going to end our worship service but I invite you to join uh, with these breakout groups in the missional communities and so uh, the fellowship group is going to meet here in the sanctuary. The, the food distribution group is going to meet in the back classroom. And the ministry partners group is going to meet upstairs. And so um, as we go, I invite you to gather together in those places and to continue to do the work that God has called us to. And now as you go, may you go oh, with the love of our Father, with the grace and the mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. But even so, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.